Welcome to this episode of Demystified as we explore home cooking in a modern world. This podcast is brought to you from the team behind Cooking List Team who are the lovely Paul Mouncey. Hello Paul. Hello Linda. And me, Linda McGowan. I still can't get used to this intro thing. It's weirding me out. I'm Sorry, weirded out. I haven't, I haven't yet worked out the perfect format. I'm, it's quite I know good. I'm changing it. It's cutting out the first bit in the middle, the uh, first bit at the beginning and uh, going straight into it. So I'm hoping that it's appreciated. No, it's quite good. No, Considering you're doing you. it on the fly, no script. No. So that's that, how we roll. That's how we roll. And I think people would know that we don't have a script by, <laughs> by now. By the drivel maybe, that comes out. Maybe we should. Uh, maybe we should. Well, uh, we should at way. least get organised enough to have topics. Well, that would help too. Yeah. But we, uh, we just did think of something then as we were setting up so that was good yes well considering where we're the season that we're at the type of cooking that we do over summer particularly in australia and over the holidays um and something that i do a lot of and a lot of different versions of especially when you know you've got a few bits and pieces of a few ingredients and you're not sure what to do with you kind of turn the barbecue on and grill some sort of animal and then you make a salad. Or vegetable. Or vegetable, exactly. yeah. Exactly, um, yes. But dressings. Yes, exactly. Yes. And there are some people who love them. Some like them on the side. Yep. Some like them all over. Some, well, and the funny thing some is... Some don't like them at all. Yeah, and some people um, call them sauces, which in my world is oh, not yes. a thing. No. Like, that's not a... That's, they're not sauces. But some people do. Yeah, I, I guess we call them a dressing because we make it on the spot... Don't we? I mean, I even no, I think it, it, yeah, dressings, but, aren't they? In a bottle, if you buy them. Yeah, I kind of, I've always mm, come at it from a, under. I've always come at it from a perspective of a sauce is a hot thing. Tomato sauce. Yeah. Okay. HP sauce. Yeah, but. Worcestershire sauce. Yeah, but. Soy sauce. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but in cooking well, where you've actually made something oh, from yes. scratch, a, a sauce is more a, a hot sort of okay. element, and a dressing is more uh, to go with cold. But yeah, I mean, to your point, soy sauce, oyster sauce, fish sauce. Now that I'm saying it, it doesn't really make much sense. <laughs> but anyway, we're, yeah, I suppose salad dressings, regardless of what, whether it's a warm vegetable salad, whether it's a potato salad, whether it's a leafy green, a tomato salad, whatever. Um, yes, dressings, pretty simple. Well, I've always been a bit stumped because I know there are times when you've made salad and there'll be a really nice sort of a simple olive oil. Yep. Just a simple olive oil and yet the ingredients from the salad itself, when it's a warm salad, will sort of change that flavour a bit. And you go, no, no, just olive oil and a little bit of salt. Salt, yeah. And uh, other times you've... You know, there's been some ingredients that you've made into that, which has made, which has changed it again. And I think that night we didn't eat the salad, but you told me you, I should have, when we were at yours. Oh yeah. Um, with the. I can't remember what it was now. Yeah. Oh, you you did a roasted tomato, roasted vegetable, and um, it was sort of a Spanish. You had some chorizo. Oh yeah, that yeah. You, yeah. That you cooked off. Yeah. And I missed it, and I thought that would be interesting. Yeah, so salad dressings are a balance between generally, and I'm generalising here, but if we like sort of separate them out into boxes, you have your sort of more creamy mayonnaise-based or yoghurt or sour cream-based salad dressings, and then you, let's say, have your oil-based salad dressings. Um, now, I know mayonnaise is made from oil, but let's just... Just for simplicity, let's just box them out. The one thing that they do all have in common, regardless of whether they're a yogurt, sour cream, mayonnaise, or a oil-based, is the balance of acid to the carrying uh, item, whether it be sour cream or oil, or yogurt or oil or whatever. Um, as you said before, olive oil for me is, that's where, and it's funny actually, I got asked a question the other day about what oil should I have in my house by a colleague of mine who had just made himself dinner because I've got some very close colleagues dotted all over the world and we've got our own little WhatsApp group. 
we often take photos of what's for dinner and because it's at all different times of the day of course um what's for dinner who's cooking what and you know and being the only chef amongst the group these questions come up so he was using first press really super superior quality extra virgin olive oil and the funny thing was was he sent a picture of it and he said i'll use this as a salad dressing just as salt it was fantastic da, da, da. and he sent a picture of it and i said i wrote back the first thing i wrote back to him was i said move it move it away from where you've got it because he had to sit it directly next to his stove so move it away from the heat source olive oil is a funny one right because it's the ubiquitous sort of and make your salad and make your dressing yeah. and use olive oil and do this and use olive oil it's not really spoken of what olive oil a lot of the time is it pure olive oil is it extra virgin is it you know what they call tuscan blend which is a mix of olive oil and vegetable oil olive extra virgin olive oil for me is as you say standalone really good by itself it it does go well with some acids but not all so one common one that you see amongst seafood is olive oil and lemon juice if anyone bothers to try it do a mix and do a calamari salad or something with olive oil and lemon juice and taste it before you do it it's terrible shocking really bad the acid levels in lemon juice do not blend well with extra virgin olive oil and the the fruit of the olive and lemon together is just a rubbish okay it's a, in my opinion it's yeah. a rubbish mix to get a good lemon dressing you need a neutral flavored oil but that said if we take something like um, a vinegar what's a good vinegar uh, even a balsamic vinegar if you like a nice aged balsamic vinegar you don't get the best out of that balsamic vinegar by using a rubbish vegetable oil it's actually olive oil carries that much better and it works much better so the acid levels what acid you're using matter to what oils you're using okay does that make sense no no yeah but but does that make sense so i always consider when i'm making dressings okay what do i want what am i looking what ingredients am i adding um and quite often the ones that i'll go to uh will be generally oil based sometimes i'll make some yogurt or do a mix of yogurt and sour cream or mayonnaise yogurt and sour cream so ranch is a really popular us one Mm -hmm. depending on where you go and who you talk to but it's that sort of more creamy base lots of herbs and all that sort of stuff um and lemon juice works in those and so do vinegars um but for me i like the and my partner prefers the maybe not so creamy dressings but the funny thing is is that if you take let's just say and here's an example of one that i do often which i do with pork so i'll make a salad and i'm with some pork belly let's say and we'll have apple and leaves and radishes and you know all the varying mm-hmm. fresh ingredients and the dressing that i make is about a spoon of whatever the spoon size is a dessert spoon of whole grain mustard about half of really good quality honey and Spanish vinegar, about half or to a full spoon of Spanish vinegar, and then I whisk in vegetable oil. And the funny thing is, is that mustard, whether it be Dijon mustard, English mustard, American mustard, whole grain mustard, whatever, mustard's an emulsifier. So it actually thickens the dressing. So if you mix mustard okay. and oil together, mm-hmm. much like you would when you make a mayonnaise, when yeah. you mix egg yeah. yolk and oil if you mix mustard and oil together the dressing thickens so mustard works as an emulsifier that's why you'll often see recipes for all manner of dressings like a classic french dressing has mustard in it. it's quite thick and a lot of people back in the day would assume that there was an egg yolk in it i can remember my mum making dressings in a jar and shaking them vigorously and they may well have had an egg yolk in it it's just to thicken them up but if you actually add it correctly Mm-hmm. you don't need the egg yolk okay. and the mustard works as a emulsifier so for vegans perfect mm-hmm. that makes um, sense. so the the trick with dressings for me is get the acid balance right and always start gentle 
So don't go too heavy with your acid because you can always add a little bit more. And if you get that emulsification thing, if you are using mustard and it's working for you, the acid, whether it be lemon juice, vinegar, those sorts of things, can thin it out to where it's not too unctuous because when you're dressing a salad, you want it to coat the salad but not drown it. Your yeah. salad, yeah. let's say the, the in the case of leaves, you don't want them drooping under the weight of the dressing. You just want a shimmer on them, a bit of a glaze on them more so. So I generally don't make dressings in bulk. So I'll make them each day or night. It takes two seconds. Right? It takes very little time. And it's just understanding things like what do. So with yogurt-based dressing, sour cream, it's already reasonably thick already. And what you're actually tending to do is try and thin that out. Whereas oil-based dressings, you're trying to thicken them up a little bit so they're not too split and separated. Now, separated and split dressings where you don't mix the oil in are also useful as well, um, depending on the, your ingredients, how much they sink, all that okay. sort of stuff. So good. that's a... You know, that sort of honey mustard is a, is a good starting point. I always think um, shallots, French shallots, echelots, depends where you're from. So not green spring onions, as we call them here, but little, they look like little onions. We call them shallots. Uh, shallots are, carry vinegars really well. So if you finely dice a shallot, it works in most dressings most oil-based dressings and they will carry the vinegar so you'll get that little vinegar bite when you bite into a leaf let's say it's got a bit of shallot dressing on it so i like shallots as well in my dressing um but i've made dressings with brown onion and you just bash it to form a puree in a mortar and pestle and you you know an onion vinegar it can be delicious you know, sugar work sugar is another thing you need on hand when you're making dressings you just need to balance the acid sometimes um, and it's not necessarily because you've added too much acid, it's just the type of acid and the other ingredients that you've got in there. So a little bit of sugar. So shallots, a good sort of standard dressing that I do is very finely diced shallots, which I'll put in a flat container and just have enough red wine vinegar to cover. Some pick thyme and a, pi a reasonable pinch of caster sugar and I'll let that sit. And what happens is the shallots go bright pink. So it looks quite attractive too. And then basis of sort of oil-based vinaigrettes and that's what i'm more so talking about is is one third vinegar two thirds oil it's a pretty good balance now it depends on the vinegar because different vinegars have different acidic levels um but that's a good starting point so at the other end of the scale uh you sort of more creamy dressings ranch you know dressing one of the probably most common in australia creamy dressings is for potato salad yes. yeah um they can be pretty much anything you like right so you can add a million different flavor profiles um you can do whatever you like i mean pesto can be its own dressing mm -hmm. if you want it yeah. to like you really it could be could be anything it's just i think with dressings you just and i hate this word but you don't want to make whatever it is you're dressing stodgy by I mean yeah. stodgy, I mean heavy. So I don't think potato salads necessarily need to be heavy. Quite often, back I remember as a kid, you know, they were this like this super thick, like you get a mouthful of yeah. mayonnaise and a bit of potato. Yeah. Um, Those are the days. Yeah, you, and it was always like this. I, I I still remember, and it wasn't that long ago actually, and I shouldn't put her in it, but I still remember. It probably is. A, it's probably maybe about eight to ten years ago but i still remember making mayonnaise in front of my partner for the first time and she was like what do you mean you make it <laughs> <laughs> like how do you get what is this white sort of thickened oh, item out funny. of a jar how, how do you make it and when she saw that it was essentially three ingredients egg mustard oil she was like ah oh, okay and then i said taste this versus that so I think, you know, mayonnaise dressings, and I, th I think getting into the habit with your yeah, more creamy dressings, even creme fraiche, anything like that, um, depending on what you're making, but I like the idea of, of mixing a lot of those together. I think it works a lot mm. better. 
So I think mayonnaise can be very heavy and monotone in flavor and it will take over. So in a potato salad, you've got potatoes which, depending on how you prep them and cook them, but let's just go with it, they've been boiled, right? So you get kind of a meh potato and then you add bacon and then you add spring onions and then egg and whatever your potato salad recipe is. Um, and then we add this super heavy monotone flavor of mayonnaise and it kind of you don't really taste anything except for mayonnaise yeah so i like the idea i mean i mean you can pack a potato salad full of herbs and all the rest of it i like the idea of actually using um, a bit of sour cream or yogurt with my mayonnaise and it gives it a totally different feel it's not as thick um and it puts a little bit of zing in the dressing as well. Now you can add zing by lemon juice and all sorts of stuff. But yeah, I just work on with your creamy base dressings, mixing a few different creamy items for want of a better term together. So mix a bit of mayonnaise with some yogurt, mix some yogurt with some sour cream. And it works really well. Like it took me a long time to get on board with that. It wasn't a thing that I sort of, coming from French cooking, it's not, sort of the thing it's quite um probably and i'm generalizing here but it's probably more a north american sort of thing that sort of very creamy base dressings um you know as i said before ranch comes to mind instantaneously but mix mix a few of those together and you'll find you get some really nice dressings and good balance um yogurt and olive oil are also a very good mixed together some really good quality natural yogurt and olive oil and, oh, you, you can add anything to it Tabasco you know diced shallots lots of herbs I like lots of fresh herbs in my dressings too depending on the application so and use soft herbs so parsley's basils not necessarily you, you wouldn't often use sage or rosemary thyme's a good one though mm, um, yeah but I think spring onions are so green onions Tarragon is really good. Bit of an aniseed kick. Um, dill is another one. You know, I'm just sort of sitting here thinking to myself, okay, so one of my favourite breakfasts is a, is a bagel with smoked salmon and, and a, a creamy dill dressing on top. Um, that being said, if I go along the same lines, another dressing which I've done over a long period of time is Dijon mustard, sugar and really good vinegar. And that's over cured salmon like Gravlax uh, and that's a classic Scandinavian preparation but there's no oil at all and it's the heat of the mustard and the sugar working against the vinegar and it's a, it's absolutely to die for but I can't think of any other use where I would use that dressing so sometimes you'll find a dressing that's just right for your purpose you don't need to necessarily mess around and try and reinvent the wheel so what do you think how much what? talking was that? <laughs> Sorry. Oh, like, man, this is, this is a good topic. It's keeping me quiet. What do you think is a really good vinegar? What, what you know, like it's not the um, ubiquitous sort of $2 for five litres vinegar that you get in supermarkets. No, I, I use that for cleaning. Yes, yep. yeah, we do. Yep. But what sort of vinegar do you have? Uh, so the vinegars in my cupboards are varied. And I, I hold a lot of vinegar because, as we've said countless times, there are two flavour enhancers in food. One is salt and the other is acid. So at the moment, my lemon tree is in sort of dormant time. There's no lemons. So vinegar is my go-to. Um, so I can tell you exactly what I have in my cupboard at the moment because I just recently did a... I actually go to a particular shop to buy my vinegars. Okay. Um, so I have champagne... Your name names? Uh, Bass Foods. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, near us. Yeah. Oh. I have champagne vinegar, tarragon vinegar, red wine vinegar, white wine vinegar, apple cider vinegar, hereth, or sherry vinegar. I think sherry vinegar is a must-have. Balsamic vinegar. They're about the six or seven that I always try and carry. Okay. And it seems it seems extreme, but I remember when I when we started cooking the steam and I was cooking out of your place, um, we went through quite a lot of red wine vinegar because I would mm. use that 
quite often. Whereas I go through quite a lot of red wine. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I think in most people's houses, I think, and I'm generalising here, um, a balsamic vinegar is a, yeah, because balsamic vinegar, you can stick it on some mozzarella, you can throw it in a tomato salad, you can reduce it down and make a glaze with it, kind of, there are different grades of balsamic vinegar. So I'd buy just a general one. Um, if I'm doing something specky, I'll buy an aged balsamic oh, vinegar. Yeah. Um, but I think it, you need a red wine, a white wine, and a balsamic. Apple cider. And an apple cider, cider too. I use that a lot. Yeah, and an apple cider. So four. The other thing I tend to use a lot too is verjuice, which isn't quite yeah. a vinegar. So that's great. Uh, it's kind of like, what is it? It's the, uh, what is it again? It's the unfermented juice from grapes. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah verjuice is a funny one because I prefer that as an addition to a like sauce or a pan sauce or something like that. I think it's a bit tamer than vinegar when it would. Mm. Um, I don't often use it as a, a okay. uh, thing in a dressing, but then again, you're a bit fancy and it's quite expensive for no. you, so... Well, um, the wonderful making beer yeah. refers to it all the time, but I do tend to cook it, cook with it more than... Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, yeah. So but I do have cook with it as well. But, yeah, and the th- the important thing about vinegars is, is that they are for cooking with as well. It's not just for creating dressings, it's for cooking with. And the reason I carry so many is because... Um, we eat a reasonable amount of fish in our house. So I like tarragon vinegar and champagne vinegar for, you know, all manner of uses for fish and making sauces And because um, tarragon isn't often something that, you know, you buy a bunch of tarragon, you use a bit and then, you mm. know. Um, so I like, I, I've always liked tarragon vinegar. Um, but certainly, like, you don't need them all. But depends on what I'm making, really. Red wine vinegar I'd probably go to more for cooking, um, unless I'm making like a mignonette for shallots, uh, for oysters or, you know, something like that. So I'm reasonably specific about what I use each one for. Um, I like the sherry vinegar for a lot of things, though. That's real good, that stuff. And buy, and buy the good one, like buy the proper Spanish one. Could we push the friendship a little bit and at some point you just kind of do a rough guide for red wine vinegar for these type of uses? Would that be helpful? Yeah, we could probably do that. Yeah. Okay. And the oils. You mentioned um, from your worldwide group of friends. Yes. Um, oils. and or Not oils. Are all oils. Ah, so very good. John Walsh. Um, <laughs> yeah. Is this? Oh, no, I think he's dead. I, I think he might have. Yeah. Um, he dropped off. What oils do you have? Okay, so um, I don't go for the pure olive oils or anything like that for cooking, um, while a lot of people do. So extra virgin olive oil for me is uh, an important part of my life. (laughs) Um, So I have extra virgin olive oil, which I keep in a very small vessel. Uh, in a dark spot generally uh, and I will top up that vessel from a larger sealed cask or tin or something like that but only keep a very small amount out because it doesn't it goes rancid quickly uh, it loses its flavour it's affected by light affected by heat I keep it away from the stove like, um, so I keep that I keep a a vegetable oil of sorts for frying so rice bran oil is probably one that I will use if I can't get that maybe just like a sunflower oil uh, because we'll have fish and chip night at home or I did some tempura like a week ago Um, so your fish and chip night you're not doing what we do 
and run I don't pick the up the phone, no. <laughs> and play some. No. I, okay, all right, you're just I'm, making sure we're on the yeah. same wavelength. So I make the potato cakes, I make the chips, I make yeah. the fish. Like, yes. We make tartar sauce. There you go, yes, there's another dressing. Are there yeah. Um, so I'll have my extra virgin olive oil, my oil for frying, which I will... Depending on what I've fried and how much I've used it, I may well run through a coffee filter and keep um, to save ditching it. Um, and then I have a very ubiquitous vegetable oil that has a high heat tolerance. So at the moment, I've got grapeseed oil because I saw some and I found some and I'll grab that. Um, but it could be canola, whatever. Neutral in flavor, something that has a high smoke point so you can cook with it. Um, and that's about where it stretches for me. If I really wanted to worry a little bit more, I'd probably buy like a Tuscan blend, which is a blend of pure olive oil, so not extra virgin. So it's like a second press uh, and vegetable oil mixed together, which can impart to a degree a little bit of flavour and you can deep fry or shallow fry with it. And uh, does it improve the end result? I struggle to see that it does. Um, but that's up for you know discussion. But I think most households you'll get away with just having a vegetable oil that has very neutral in flavour that's super versatile. Because um, grapeseed oil is not inexpensive, right? So rice bran oil works okay, but just a canola is fine because you can deep fry with it, make a mayonnaise, make a dressing, do whatever you want. Right? So I think most households invest in really really good extra virgin olive oil and small amounts at a time and have a vegetable oil and the bases are almost covered really i mean we're not commercial catering at home no i am sometimes (laughs) (laughs) um but yeah that's that that's about what you need i think and given that most people aren't deep frying often um you know if you are deep frying often then it's worth looking at a specific oil just for your deep frying needs and the last little thing on this salts I know we've had a, a big discussion yeah. about salt yeah but what do you have two types or three types of salt in your pantry I'm counting them in my head <laughs> oh oops or do you have 18 no I've got a few mm-hmm. okay so I have rock salt yep uh, so that's the big chunky grains uh, and it's not because I grind it I have rock salt because I bake vegetables on it like the kohlrabi yep Yep. Um, I'll use it under a plate of oysters so the oysters don't slide around everywhere Uh, more often than not it's used for me for a baking sort of baking vegetable purpose Um, so I have that I have crappy one dollar a two kilo bag cooking salt that's for play-doh <laughs> play-doh well yeah yeah that's for mm-hmm. you know making play-doh uh like the other day what happened here not that you saw but i spilt some stock i think i heard yeah yeah <laughs> you didn't hear the stock you heard no, I the heard voice the, yes oh. i heard yeah. that um, yes. so i'll use that for a spill to draw moisture up off the ground. Mm-hmm. Um, not that I'm spreading salt all over the ground, but you know, no. dog wheeze on the carpet or something, right? Yeah. So I've just got that crappy salt. Um, I have what's probably commonly known as a finishing salt. Okay, so more like, like a flake, flake salt, yeah. like Molden or Murray River or... Um, Pink Himalayan? No, because they don't do a flake salt. Oh, don't they? Okay. No. Well, not that I've seen. Um, and then I have kosher salt. So the salt that I use the most, which costs me more than anything else, is kosher salt. And the reason I use it, and I use it in all my dressings, and that's the other thing I didn't mention in dressings, you've got to season your dressings. And if you're seasoning your dressings, you uh, use a salt that's going to disperse, right? So you don't want to use... Well, I mean, you can use flake salt and pinch it down and stuff like that but kosher salt is probably better um so i use kosher salt because it hasn't got any iodine in it every other salt does including himalayan 
uh-huh. pink salt. Um, I have at times bought specialty salts, uh, black salt, smoke salt, da 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 da. The problem with all of them is they have iodine in them. And the problem with that is it gives a metallic taste. And we have done a half an hour expose on salts. Have we? Earlier podcast. (laughs) Right. So for full details, we can uh, refer back to that one. But that's interesting. And another thing, just the last thing that I can think of is pepper. Because we've had discussions about black pepper, which does leave marks. Flakes, yeah. And um, ground... Uh, no, no. Um, yeah. yeah, you're yeah, right. Ground, ground white pepper. Yeah, ground yeah. white pepper. That's yeah. it. So what? on my, I've got a little sort of piece of timber, which sits adjacent to my cooktop, and on that I have a pepper grinder and a salt grinder because I, even though kosher salt is pretty fine, I it goes through the grinder for me. So I have a pepper and salt grinder, two lovely copper numbers that my partner bought me for my birthday. I also have various salt pigs set up there. So I have, one will have cooking salt in it, and I'll use that for pasta water. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, cooking salt in it, rock salt, and flake salt. And the flake salt's the smallest one because it salts draw moisture. Okay, so you don't want it to go all cruddy. I've got another little pot next to that which has ground white pepper in it and then I have my two very small bottles of oil extra virgin olive oil and vegetable oil just little bo- glass bottles with a pourer on them and that's my and there's a jar there also that has a lid which I keep my garlic in but that's my setup at home it's almost identical to what I have here yeah, yeah. Um, that's my setup at home and nine times out of ten for if I am using pepper in a dressing, it will be the ground white because I don't like to see the little black flecks. But mm. that's a personal choice. Okay. But yeah, so it's not quite all about dressings, but you know. No, no but it's yeah, it's a step. In They're it. almost like we're almost talking about pantry, you know, must-haves. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's probably more appropriate. A little started on dressings, but we shifted a little bit. But, I, but they're all like, part of the dressing. Yeah, and the thing about it is, is that you know that your cooking's getting, well, you know your cooking's maybe improving when, it's funny actually, my sister-in-law will come over to our house and look in the fridge and go, nothing in the fridge. This is what she'll say. And then an hour later, 20 minutes later, we've cooked something and I've got dressings and I've got this, I've got that. And I've done it. I think you know your cooking is getting good when you can have minimal ingredients on hand and make something out of them by using them in a, not a correct fashion, but it, using them in maybe different ways which you didn't think. So what she doesn't see is in the, she'll open the pantry and yeah, there's a couple of boxes of cereal there and a bag of chips and whatever. But what she doesn't see is the seven vinegars there, which I can make a gazillion different dressings out of. And I've got some potatoes and vegetables and a few leaves and a few tomatoes and da da da. And all of a sudden, you know, one chorizo sausage, everyone will look at that and go, what are you making? And, you know, quite often I'll get things like, you know, those, those wraps, you know, yeah. we do wraps for yeah. all these lunches or whatever. I'll take some of those wraps and I'll tear them into shreds and make croutons out of them. And that's another part of my salad. You know, so... Although it looks like a, a minimal amount of food, a minimal amount of ingredients, you can actually create a lot. But as long as you've got some sort of base level, I suppose, pantry items is what we're talking about. The right oils, the right vinegars, a few mustards and a bit of honey and, you know, some acids, lemon juice, whatever, and away you go. Well, thank you for that. Well, I don't know where we went with that, but anyway. But thank you. Now I'm inspired to go home and make a salad. Well, you see, the thing about it is, is you actually, and I haven't been to your house in quite a long time, but I know your pantry situation. It hasn't changed. Yes, I know. (laughs) And probably the last bottle of soy sauce I bought and all of that sort of stuff is still sitting in there. Oh, and that's another one. Like, soy sauce goes really well with olive oil too. Very well, in fact. What doesn't soy sauce go well with? Soy sauce goes really well with really good olive oil. Good soy sauce, good olive oil. Squeeze the lime juice, you know. So then you're heading down the Asian, Asian path, like. Yeah. You, but you're working with salty acids, you know. Mm-hmm. Fish sauce is another thing you should have. 
I do. Yeah, I do. always have fish sauce. You've got to have fish mm-hmm. sauce because fish sauce is the, really provides proper good umami to things. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a Add that to endless the list, topic. Paul. Add it to the list of things, just must haves of oils, salts, yeah. vinegars, just as a starter. Okay. All right, we can do that. Where are we going to put but it? When you say we. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> Maybe know I'll just say, like, what were you talking about the other day? I can talk to a, a computer screen. It can put it all in writing for me. Maybe we'll yes. do that. We can do that. <laughs> we have the technology. We have the technology. Potentially. If Allegedly. We can, if we can figure it out. Allegedly. How to use it. We just have to figure out how to use it. Oh, well, well done. Well, thank you for that. Thank you for sharing, as ever. Yes. And we'll thank be back you. on Friday. We'll be back on Friday for a quick catch up and see what we've been cooking. Yep. And uh, until then, happy cooking. Happy Thank cooking. You all. Enjoy Take care, your dressing, everybody. Mikey. Bye, everybody. See ya. Bye. Thanks for listening to this podcast as we explore home cooking in a modern world. We'd love you to subscribe, and for more information, please go to our website, cookingwithsteam.com. Mm-hmm.